it has been such a pleasure listening to him and all he has said would go a very long way yes ma'am uh, i agree with you thank you ma'am with this we move on to the third session of rupkatha international open conference 2021 it is my privilege to introduce the conference chair professor amrit sen officiating director of vishwa bharti publications division a noted scholar dr sen has had, has an extensive presence in the world of academia dr sen graces the department of english institute of languages literature and culture at vishwa bharti we welcome you sir i request you to take over the session now over to you sir thank you for your kind words am i audible and visible you are audible and visible right a very good morning to everybody here and uh, of course a good afternoon for everybody to pit pada who is in mexico and the others who are in different parts of the world uh, i uh, thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to share my ideas and listen to some very stimulating uh, discussions as the earlier ones went and uh, i would just like to uh, sort of introduce uh, this particular panel to you uh, we will have four papers i i hope the four uh, panelists are here uh, uh, we'll have uh, dominica uh, with a paper on material culture we have dr chitra and munna gurung who will talk about the green school which we were discussing we have uh, rajan and dr sujata to talk about petro modernity and uh, the a world where oil has been exhausted and then we have uh, mr thomas and dr prashant kumar talking about ecological migration which has become a rather important uh, subject in the modern humanities and Uh, anthropologies now since this uh, this entire session is titled anthropocene studies i just like to begin this session by making a few opening remarks now i will not linger on the concept of the anthropocene studies as such many of the scholars here are well versed in it it's a relatively new term and the dating of the word anthropocene has also been a subject of much uh, debate exactly when does the anthropocene start but it's now more or less accepted that we've entered the age of the anthropocene and we are looking at um, human kind having changed the the structure and the future of the earth as it were and therefore its impact on societies economies people have been extremely uh, provocative and is undergoing a process of giant acceleration so we are crossing as we say new thresholds almost every uh, almost every decade as it were not every decade almost every 2 or 3 years now i really have nothing much to say about this particular aspect that they they will be debated fed fed bare by a lot of people we we looking at uh, issues of economics anthropology but as a student of literature what i am more interested in is how is this depicted how is this represented the presence of the anthropocene that's point number 1 and point number 2 is something which i asked a little earlier what does one do about it in one's own limited ways i i just heard professor talking about think globally and act locally and the third question is who are the people we can go back to and one of my inspirations in this field and somebody whom i'll very briefly discuss with you is the indian nobel laureate poet rabindranath tagore who sort of built our university established vishbharati uh vishbharati by the way means a place where the world comes in a single nest and yet rabindranath tagore's entire project was to also sort of distribute the fruits of this knowledge to the local population and harness in turn their local knowledge for global consumption now tagore has a very interesting uh sort of short 
uh, introduction to uh, an Englishman, Elmhurst, who came to uh, India and wrote something called the robbery of the soil. So, you know, the concept of the environment was very central to this school and university. And Elmhurst, while working in the rural areas, was looking at the rapid depletion of the resources of the soil as it were. And this provoked the go. Soil. I'm sorry, uh, is there a problem? Thank you. Now, Tagore, of course, created in his own uh, unique ways a certain dystopia when he talks about the robbery of the soil. And he talks about, he looks at the moon and suggests, and I'm reading from Tagore, uh, it's beautiful prose. He says, I often imagine that the moon, being smaller in size than the earth, produced the condition for life to be born on a soil earlier than was possible. Once she too perhaps had her constant festival of color, music, and a movement. Her storehouse was perpetually replenished with food for her children. Then in course of time, some race was born to her that was gifted with the furious energy of intelligence and that began greedily to devour its surroundings. It produced beings who, because of the excess of their animal spirit, coupled with intellect and imagination, failed to realize that the mere process of addition, and this is a very interesting phrase that Tagore uses, the mere process of addition did not create fulfillment. The mere size of its acquisition did not produce happiness. That greater velocity of movement did not necessarily constitute progress and change could only have meaning in relation to some clear ideal of completeness. And then comes this last, uh, almost clinical finish to this entire dystopic vision. At last, one day the moon, like a fruit whose pulp had been completely eaten by the insects which it had sheltered, became a hollow shell, a universal grave for the voracious creatures who insisted upon consuming the world into which they had been born. In other words, and this is where Tagore becomes so very relevant. Remember, this is being written in 1922. In other words, they behaved exactly in the same way human beings of today are behaving upon this earth, fast exhausting their source of sustenance, not because they must live their normal life, but because they wish to live at a pitch of monstrous excess. So one of the things that Anthropocene studies for me as a student of literature provides is the ways of you know, creating dystopias and representations of the acuteness of the crisis so that it can not only be represented, but addressed. Now, the other question that I need to ask is, and this is something which I put forward to Dr. Powell, is what does one do about it? I'm mean, saying, what in our own limited ways could we do about it? And Tagore took a very interesting experiment and he built his own school in Shantiniketan where the environment became a major part of the syllabus. Now, Tagore realized, of course, that, you know, every day, of course, environmental studies is a part of the curriculum in India. And I'm quite sure this is true also in the West and everywhere. But environmental studies there becomes a kind of a dry subject, something which is just part of a syllabus, which is studied, regurgitated, and really not acted upon by the child. So what does the child really do? How does one make the subject interesting to the child? How does one create a bridge between the aesthetic and the Anthropocene? This is something which I'm trying to take a very short look at. And if I may be permitted, I'd just like to share uh, uh, two photographs uh, that I have, uh, which uh, Tagore, uh, sort of two festivals that Tagore uh, dedicated to his university. 
The first is called in Bangla, it's called Brikshropana, which in English would be the tree plantation festival. Now what, if you look at that picture, you can see that a sapling becomes the subject of the festival as it were. So the tree is not just merely recognized as an animate object, it is also reconciled and recognized as part of the human family. So in doing so, the very concept of the anthropos, that of man, becomes widened to embrace the very concept of the plant. In fact, one of his poems, Vasundhara, which means the earth, Rabindranath calls the tree an equal member of the family. Now we've seen also in many, in many movements in India, especially in the Chipko movement, uh, where you know, uh, the people have just embraced the trees and considered it as part and parcel of their being and an extension of, of uh, their selfhood as it were. So, Tagore is not only put, uh, putting environment into the pedag pedag pedagogy as it were, he's also trying to inculcate a sense of, you know, participation, ownership. Let's not be, use the word ownership that becomes again loaded with political ideas, but a kind of inclusivity of the human and the natural. And this, I think, is an interesting experiment, which uh, would, you know, infuse the child. And I insist, because we were talking about the green school, that environmental consciousness, the idea of the Anthropocene, the consequences of the Anthropocene, need to be put into pedagogy, as it were, at a very early stage. Now, this is another very interesting uh, photograph. It's a very rare photograph, in fact, of the great poet actually sort of drawing the plow. This is in, in Bengali is called the hollow portion or the pulling of the plow. Uh, you will remember that at that point of time, there were no tractors in India. So the plow was the only way through which ag agriculture could be, uh, sort of could be done. And the, uh, the cow was very often used to pull the, uh, the plow. And what Tagore is doing, interestingly, is he's sanctifying this. He's sanctifying this by drawing from the Puranas and the Vedas, the hymns that are dedicated to worship. So this process of sanctification that we saw also earlier in this particular festival is an attempt to somewhere link the age old or the ancient Indian idea of the tapovan or the harmonious existence of the human and the natural into the modern as it were. Obviously, you know, modern for Tagore would be very different from what modernity is for us nowadays, but in the way in which the animal, the soil, and the act of agriculture is sanctified in a way so that the human, the animal, and the soil are together brought through in a spirit of joy. You see, that's one of the issues which I would like to also address. You know, Anthropocene studies very often ignores two very important aspects, the aesthetic and the joyous. Now, once these two elements could be brought into the representation and the practice of addressing the question of Anthropocene, I think there could be a greater kind of a stress and a kind of uh, an incentive at a very basic level in education to engage, uh, uh, to engage uh, students, school children, to engage with the question of the Anthropocene. So that is something that I would, would like to share with you since, you know, we are discussing very critical ideas, but the praxis of that critical idea, the representations of those critical ideas equally need to be suggested to see what are the ways in which one can move forward. 
Now that's a very, uh, I'm sorry for lingering a little bit, but let me now uh, invite our first uh, panelist, if she's here, is, uh, is Dominica uh, Asdair here from, is she here? She's not here, sir. She's not here, okay. Let me then invite Dr. Chitra and uh, Muna Gurum to present their uh, paper on the concept of green school in Bhutan. So I, I think uh, that ties in nicely with the ideas that I was yes, trying to discuss. The concept of green school in Bhutan for holistic uh, education and uh, development. Mm, I can see that you know uh, both of them are uh, involved in the process of education in Bhutan. So we are willing. We're looking forward with great uh, interest uh, to listen to their uh, presentation. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Hope my screen is visible and I'm audible. Yes, you are, ma'am. Both visible and audible. Uh, respected Chair, it's my pleasure to continue this presentation after your brief introduction on Anthropocene and highlighting the important aspects of it. And it is also a continuation of the session of Takures Paudil. It dies as well as you have mentioned. This paper is titled as The Concept of Green School in Bhutan for Holistic Education and Development. When we talk about the idea of green school, it is a GNH approach to education. That's how it is seen, because deep at the heart of a green school is the vision of development called gross national happiness articulated by His Majesty, the fourth King of Bhutan, Jigme Singhe Wangchu. And when it comes to gross national happiness, it measures the quality of a country in a more holistic way with, it, with the belief that the beneficial development of human society takes place when material and spiritual development occurs side by side to complement and reinforce each other. And on this, the policies are framed to lead the nation in the development path. This is the clarification of the title, what development means and how it is linked with education. To move further, education is considered as the means to meet this goal, the guiding philosophy of the nation, and the role of green school is considered vital here for the wholesome development of individuals with which the nation can develop and progress in a sustained manner. With this, if I introduce the claim of this paper, it is to show the purpose of education is not only to prepare students to score grades and to fit in the job market, but also to nurture them as complete human beings with a sense of direction and moral uprightness that lends meaning and purpose to life. In this context, the authors of this paper attempted to explore how the constituents of the Green School aim to reclaim the principles, the core principles of teaching and learning by integrating the physical and psychosocial ambience with the necessary orientation of mind and heart in the cultivation of the true and the good, the useful and the graceful. If I could uh, take you through the background, as, as such, Bhutan had system, making students wiser in search of self. But contrary to it, when modern education was introduced in the 1960s, it aimed at making the students more skillful and productive that produces individuals driven by personal success and ambition. And the focus turned toward the external aspects in pursuit of wealth and worldly happiness. On the two ways, there is a paper titled On the Two Ways of Learning in Bhutan, which sums up these two ways, that modern education is strongly influenced by materialism 
and spiritual endeavors, if any, became marginal. Because a student is encouraged at an early stage of learning to opt for subjects through which one can develop skills. And these skills are put forth in use to earn a better living or to choose a profession that is financially lucrative and socially beneficial. This goal of modern education has been narrowed, is considered very narrow since it equates knowledge and skills only with career. As a result, the flourishing of a holistic human being, which is the true purpose of education, has been left behind. This is what we have been afraid of. Therefore, the situation demanded a kind of education that is focused not only on individualistic needs, but also on our conscious, being conscious of others' needs so as to share and collaborate in finding solutions collectively. This gave way for the initiative Educating for Gross National Happiness by the Ministry of Education in 2009. And then as a result of this initiative, it gave way to the birth of the book which the author in the picture is holding, titled My Green School, an Outline. And this is also aligns well with uh, the research outputs reviewed by looking at other literatures which says the current education system cannot sustain its goals if it continues only with the narrow vision of the materialistic values, since the current needs of the students and the environment are also getting different. It is different because there is a pressure on the environment due to the exploitation of both renewable and non-renewable sources, and the current youth are also different because they need, in today's time, they are the ones who need more of spiritual guidance because they have innumerable options to choose from and there is a necessity on them to distinguish between basic needs and wants, basic requirements and the luxury of goods and services. So as a response to this current situation, the values contained in the eight cardinal elements of your green school as well as the nine domains of gross national happiness, which is considered to be the developmental philosophy of Bhutan, are considered important to restore the holistic values of educational system, not only pertaining to Bhutan, but the, for the world as such. Here, the term holistic means it takes into account the affective dimension of learning, as well as the cognitive dimension. This is uh, the picture of both. The affective dimension uh, takes and uh, tries to promote the socio-emotional skills, socio-cultural values, and the spirituality, whereas the cognitive dimension takes care of only knowledge and skills for workforce development. But what is required today is both. The wholesome individuals are in the requirement of both the affective and cognitive dimensions in its fullest development. This is what GNH and Green School are aspiring for. And the Sherig Mandala is introduced in the text by the author. And this Sherig Mandala, which is uh, pictured here, this is uh, called the Sherig Mandala. It contained the eight aspects of life and learning process. And it rests on the claim that at the very least, an individual is a combination of all these components, such as natural, social, cultural, intellectual, academic, aesthetic, spiritual, and moral elements. These are the eight elements that the Sherig Mandala is comprised of. However, the three R's in the classroom, which the modern education focuses on to build the cognitive aspect of education is narrow in the sense it's not focusing on the development of the wholesome personality in an individual. Thus, in the broadest term, these eight elements of a green school will help to reposition one's attitude toward teaching and learning by modifying the behavior towards our society, our community, and to our surroundings. Because what is learned in the seats of learning should have a bigger purpose than is the case today is the argument beneath it. In terms of uh, these are the characteristics of Green School with the eight cardinal elements. Let me take a few of these elements for today's discussion in the interest of time. 
In terms of physical greenery, when natural environment becomes the learning field, learning begins naturally. And this natural environment is ample. 60% of forest cover is maintained at any point of time as the speaker has uh, reiterated in his speech. So it is the setting itself is in a natural environment, which the physical greenery implies. And it also becomes beyond the setting, it also becomes the learning field where learning be begins naturally without any compulsion, rather with inquisitive questions and meaningful inquiry. Here, if I go with an example, um, the petal arrangement in plants and flowers would be the means for students to study mathematical patterns and sequences before getting into the real textbook and the real learning, they can learn the arrangement, the mathematical pattern and sequence by observing the arrangement of petals in the flowers, which is popularly known as Fibonacci sequence. By observing the arrangement of leaves in a plant, where the new leaves do not cover the old ones, children can learn about survival skills with the implied message that there is enough for everyone in the world. Philosophically, it shows one cannot obstruct the growth of the other and life skill becomes a critical part of learning. And moreover, children can also understand the meaning of green only from their first-hand experience and engagement with nature to learn about growth, regeneration, ecology, environment and sustainability, as well as the meaning of self-reliance by reaping the benefits of their produce by maintaining vegetable garden and uh, flowers, flower garden in their school, they tend to know the meaning of self-reliance as well as the dignity of labor. This is what is emphasized in the nine domains of GNH also with environment as an important domain and at most attention is given to environment in both these concepts to emphasize the importance of interdependence which is an indispensable factor of human existence. And with advancement in science and technology, uh, we have human beings, um, we are exploiting the environment for our personal benefits. Therefore, it is necessary for children to be taught that human interaction with the environment is not only for food, fuel, and water, but for sensory learning and to understand the value of giving and receiving. There is a paper titled Educating for Gross National Happiness, and this paper has been reviewed to support this argument, which states uh, children, uh, when they are engaged with nature, they can accommodate a wide range of behavior as nature helps to improve children's mental health and it cultivates social connectedness. They learn about interdependence, eco-consciousness, sustainability, not merely as concepts to derive knowledge and insights from textbooks, but they can also very well relate these ideas due to their firsthand working experience with nature. They can relate it with the real world experience to build resilience and to tackle the challenges of life, at least sustainability, and to appreciate the dignity of labor. Uh, and they also learn, most importantly, a philosophical lesson of non-dominant values, such as not to overpower nature. That's the attitude they learn through their engagement with nature by means of physical greenery, which is the first cardinal element of green school. Then followed by this, they are trained to become a responsible social human being with an emphasis on cooperation and collaboration between the school and the community and tolerance, they are taught the meaning of tolerance because today uh, children uh, could not mingle with students who are different from them or who think different than them. As a result, there is lack of social values and with more uh, technology, we are becoming more isolated also. So social greenery teaches children to live and learn together, respecting the uniqueness as well as the commonness in human beings and by building positive energy that can make a society a better place. And cultural dimension is another educative asset which is emphasized here. Uh, this contributes to the development of students' creativity, cultural identities and intercultural understanding 
and school creates the space for the expression and for the celebration of such uh, cultural experiences and it cultivates grace and ease in them, which corresponds with the cultural diversity promoted in the nine domains of GNH that welcomes regional varieties and appreciates it. Because happiness is considered intrinsic to development and no meaningful development can occur without cultural vitality and growth along with a peaceful environment that allows spiritual nourishment is the underlying belief. Therefore, the first three dimensions of a green school discussed here emphasizes on effective dimension of learning in children uh, to bring, to make their life holistic with, and it cultivates positive energy and goodwill. And from here, they move on to the academic green to learn about different subjects, and to explore the ideas and values in each of the discipline, not just as a discipline, but they have the question why they learn poetry and why do they learn calculus? So when they move to different subjects, this question why is also addressed in this academically green school where they understand that each of these disciplines is a vast continent of ideas and information. This is how a positive mental disposition to new ideas, knowledge and information and exposure to thinkers and philosophers happen, which enriches their cognitive domain taken care of by academic green and intellectual greenery. Here, I would like to draw the idea of Paul Fryer, a Brazilian educator from his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, who argues that today's education suffers from narration sickness because the narrating subject is the teacher and the listening object becomes the student. Therefore, there is a subject-object teaching learning process happens where the narration, the process of narration makes the lessons more stereotyped, lifeless, and petrified. Also, he, he refers to the modern education as the banking concept of education, which allows us to be a passive learner, only storing the information which is equated to money deposited in the bank. Now, this, uh, the idea of the green school prevents, uh, the modern system of education actually prevents uh, children from discovering their talents and their aesthetic sensibilities. Against this, the aesthetically green school enables children to be active and appreciative of the beautiful and the graceful by enabling them to distinguish between appearance and reality. This is, again, another essential point because in the present era, children and youth have become more or less compliant consumers to devour the unauthentic information circulated in the media. And it is very important to distinguish between uh, the true and the real, because even fake and untrue things become true to them in the media when it is circulated as authentic information. Therefore, the aesthetic greenery teaches students to value the difference between good and worthwhile and also what is right and what is wrong. This takes them to the next level and connects them with the spiritual and the metaphysical by lifting them above their mundane self and connecting them to a higher level of consciousness where they can explore the spiritual needs in the classroom. Because if spiritual needs are unmet, their emotional development will also be negatively impacted. Therefore, mindfulness is encouraged by means of meditation, and this mind training helps children to get rid of negativity, stress, worry, fear, anxiety. Yes, I will conclude. I will conclude here, sir. To get better focus, concentration, openness, positivity, etc. Uh, this shares the domain of psychological well-being. Uh, and it enables them to discover the meaning and the purpose of education with positive behavior, emotional quotient, and strong character in students. So in this way, uh, Green School fosters model greenery also, which acts as the centrifugal force that makes development happen in all the other uh, constituent elements. That's, this is how the school becomes a training ground that could transform the students and it could secure their future as well as the future of the nation. It can broaden the horizon of education by removing the bottlenecks from the current system of education and bring about a meaningful reform. 
and the it is an all inclusive education of encompassment that has moved from right to education to right education by emphasizing nobility of mind heart and hands thank you sir uh, thank you dr chitra thank you for that very informative and perceptive paper i'm sure there will be uh, questions on the ideas that have been generated uh, through this paper but we'll take the questions at the end of the session we are already running a little late so okay. let me now invite our next uh, uh, speakers uh, are rajan and dr k sujata dr sujata is uh, associate professor uh, is uh, uh, principal and associate professor in the department of english emerald heights college for women and uh, rajan is a phd research scholar and guest lecturer in the department of english at government arts and science college the paper is titled a study on petro modernity and the social socio cultural implications of oil and the disintegration of human behavior in james howard kunstler's world made by hand so we're looking at uh, a paper which will discuss a dystopic situation uh, dr sujata may i request you to keep to the time limit of 10 minutes thank you please go ahead thank you uh, thank you sir uh, good afternoon uh, john and all present here i am uh, very much pleased uh, to present my uh, research paper in this international conference so my uh, my research paper title is a study on petro modernity and the socio cultural implications of oil and the disintegration of human behavior in james howard kunstler's world made by hand so in this uh, research i have used a new emerging uh, literary genre called energy humanities so energy humanities uh, is an emerging field like digital and medical humanities which talks about the significance of the existing energy systems in the society so let's discuss about the concepts concepts explained in energy humanities in our uh, upcoming slides let's move to the introduction part so uh, from the grand old times to till now uh, human beings consciously or unconsciously uh, directly or indirectly uh, depend upon energy resources in one way or other way in the initial days uh, human beings used wood for cooking as well as uh, heating purposes later they moved on from wood to charcoal because uh, it has high production of heat and it frames uh, better than wood later we moved on from charcoal to coal and in the present past five decades we are excessively depend upon uh, fossil fuels and uh, most of the people uh, in the society uh, have a false uh, notion that uh, we consume fossil fuels only for uh, transportation purposes but beyond that we consume um, fossil fuel components such as tar asphalt paraffin wax diesel gasoline jet fuel plastic cement vitamin capsules and so on so there is always an invisible hand uh, of fossil fuel in our society so oil is not just a commodity oil is turned as a quintessential thing necessary for the welfare of a society next so according to the words of uh, dipesh chakravarti um, the mansions of modern freedom stands on the ever expanding base of fossil fuel so our modern conception such as globalization industrialization urbanization rapid advancements in trade and commerce our human mobility all stands on the foundation of cheap and abundant availability of uh, fossil fuels so this high and free flow of energy systems in the into the society made us modern so far uh, so then uh, according to the words of according to the words of um, uh, Jennifer Wenzel we are fossil fuel creatures and we belongs to a culture named petro uh, petro cultures because directly or indirectly we human beings largely consume uh, fossil fuels in one way or other way so we can call ourselves as fossil fuel creatures and we belongs to a culture named petro cultures so the statement of my uh, research problem is human being human beings um, human beings uh, reliance on fossil fuels is increasing day by day and we are living a high energy intensive lifestyles so the non availability 
fuel uh, brings in the near future the, no the non availability of fossil fuel brings social cultural political economical as well as aesthetical transition in the society uh, which can be well understood uh, with the post oil uh, fiction uh, novel named world made by hand and furthermore the non availability of fossil fuels in the near future brings behavioral changes among individuals so uh energy humanities i wish to give a small introduction about uh, the new genre named energy humanities so the main objective behind energy humanities is to provide a humanistic approach um, to the existing energy conceptions in the society so the initial idea of energy humanities uh, is initiated by a research group named after oil school um, in the university of alberta in 2013 so the prominent figures of this research group are imri zeman dominic boyer sheena wilson adam carlson and so on so the main objectives of the after oil school is to refashion the present hydrocarbon environment and the next important objective of after oil school is to create a conscious energy transition from this excessive dependence upon fossil fuel to some other form of sustainable energy resources so the next uh, important objective of the school is to think or to conceptualize a world after oil so for this uh, research uh, i have selected a, a novel uh, named world made by hand uh, it is written by james howard kunzler uh, so it belongs to a genre of uh, post oil uh, fiction and uh, it's a speculative fiction uh, set in an imaginative uh, town named union grove uh, in uh, united states so the entire all the characters in the novel uh, is suffering from an energy impasse so energy impasse is a term coined by imri zeman one of the research scholars belongs to the school of of royal school uh, according to him energy impasse is an inactive or a dormant state in which society fails to function effectively in the absence of oil so in the novel robert earl who initially worked as a corporate executive in the oil world and after the fossil fuel got depleted he turned as a carpenter for his living and after the fossil fuel got depleted in the novel we can see that the electricity turned as a mirage because it's a fact that according to international energy association nearly 43 percentage of united states electricity is produced because of burning fossil fuels when electricity turned as a uh, mirage uh, all the uh, modern technological advancements got collapsed so robert earl lost his own wife and daughter due to the out outbreak of pandemic um, in the novel and uh, he, uh, his own son uh, moved to some other part of united states uh, for a better life then another important character uh, in the novel is uh, lauren holder who initially worked as a pastor in the congregational church and his wife name is uh, jane both hold a respectable position in the oil world when the fossil fuel got depleted they lost the significance um, they lost the significance in the society and they feel very much absurd about their own uh, existence uh, jennifer wensel one of the research scholars uh, belongs to the uh, petroculture's group uh, she pre she predicts that in the post oil world people will turn clueless and immobile uh, about their own existence uh, her prediction uh, came true uh, in the novel all the major characters in the novel suffers uh, suffers a kind of uh, absurdity and uncertain about their own existence so in the novel uh, we can see that uh, robert laments about uh, the uh, laments that the old highway bridge is in terrible condition so in the oil world people are very much ignorant about their existing uh, energy systems and they don't have any kind of awareness uh, regarding the existing energy systems in the society when the fossil fuel got depleted uh, robert earl the protagonist of the novel started realizing the importance of uh, fossil fuels uh, because uh, the highway bridge can't be reconstructed the prestigious highway bridge in the town can't be reconstructed uh, due to the non availability of fossil fuels and cement so imri zeman the research scholar uh, in the field of energy humanities states that the global space is getting tinier day by day because of the complex web of transportation is getting wider uh, for example if i need to uh, purchase a product uh, in united states um, i can get it uh, here in india within 2 to 3 to 4 um, working days so this complex web of uh, transportation is uh, based on the cheap and abundant availability of uh, fossil fuels once the fossil fuel got depleted the entire society will face a scarcity of all kind of essential uh, commodities likewise in the novel robert earl laments that in the oil world um, 
they used to wear sophisticated shoes and sandals once the fossil fuel got depleted they forced to use uh, sandals made of automobile tire tracks and leather straps so and another important thing is people need to cultivate people forced to cultivate their own food pro- uh, food products in the um, post oil world and uh, robert earl uh, suffers from a personal as well as professional failure because he lost his passionate profession uh, in the post oil world uh, as well as he lost his loved ones his wife as well as his children uh, due to the outbreak of pandemic so according to my observation if a non availability will arise in near future it will definitely affect the social imaginaries of people social imaginaries is nothing but the set of values uh, symbols uh, through which we perceive our society so the social imaginaries of the people in the novel got entirely shattered down in the absence of oil uh, for example uh, after the outbreak of a pandemic nearly half of the population in the town got wiped out and the education sector one of the integral component uh, of a society uh, got entirely shattered uh, even robert earl the protagonist of the novel um, states that the schooling reduced to a little church of leader cat and the proper living conditions of people was so in the novel i have also incorporated put forward by uh, sigmund bauman so sigmund bauman's uh, according to sigmund bauman's liquid modernity Uh, if in the post modern world if an external disturbances happen uh, the people in the society will um, turn uncertain uh, and ambiguous about their own existence about their own existence uh, so uh, people uh, in the post oil world people will uh, exhibit a deviant uh, behavior uh, in the novel also uh, the antagonist of the novel uh, went up to initially uh, worked as a trucker And, uh, and and very much passionate about uh, motor sports and after the fossil fuel got uh, depleted um, he in order for his survival he started running a store in the town so in order to run a store he started stealing goods from the neighbors and uh, his uh, robert uh, sorry uh, wayne cop and his crew started exhibiting deviant uh, behavior and they they wish to spend their remaining part of uh, life through consuming drugs and they don't have any kind of uh, definite objective towards uh, their life after the fossil fuel got uh, depleted then uh, the extra marital relationship uh, the robert earl uh, the protagonist of the novel uh, is having an extra marital uh, relationship with his own friends wife uh, jane you have to uh, you have to conclude in 2 minutes please hmm? okay sir okay sir uh, the extra marital uh, relationship Uh, at the same time uh, jane uh, also ha- jane don't have possess any kind of guilt or shame for having an extra marital uh, relationship with um, uh, robert earl both validate their personal losses um, in the relationship and in the in the relationship also they don't possess any kind of uh, intimacy all the characters in the novel try to escape uh, themselves uh, in, from the uh, absence of oil so uh, according to uh, the last my important uh, thing i wish to convey is um, i incorporated a theory put forward by jonathan hyde's uh, moral matrix uh, theory according to jonathan hyde there are six foundational blocks necessary for the welfare of a society they are care liberty fairness loyalty authority and sanctity all these six foundational blocks got collapsed after the fossil fuel got uh, depleted so the my findings of my research is Uh, an energy transition is inevitable uh, in the near future if an energy transition happen it will definitely affect the social imaginaries of uh, people and oil acts as an equilibrium between the individual and a society then the next important thing is the fossil fuel uh, the energy transition in the near future will definitely will be a social cultural political as well as aesthetical transition uh, in the society if a, uh, if an energy transition happens in the near future it may affect uh, the behavior of uh, individuals uh, in the society uh, for thank you sir thank you for uh, charging for your excellent presentation i i just uh, would uh, probably questions will certainly come in at the end of the session but uh, maybe we could just begin uh, thinking about you know two things one is how the power structures of society are changed with the uh, uh, with the decline of oil as it were and secondly the question uh, that uh, of course needs to be addressed is there was a time when you know fossil fuels were not in circulation so 
the kind of matrix that you were creating, whether they uh, were dis sort of disturbed prior to the existence of oil, uh, is something we need to ponder about. You know, this is something I'm sure the uh, audience will probably ask you later on. Uh, I'll meanwhile move on to my uh, to the next uh, speaker. We have uh, a very interesting um, subject here. Uh, uh, the paper is by uh, Tejas Gigi Thomas, who is a research scholar at the Department of English, Bellore Institute of Technology, and Dr. Prashant Kumar, uh, Assistant Professor, at the Department of English at the same school. Uh, uh, they will be talking about eyes everywhere, ecological migration, and state surveillance in the age of Iron Man. So, uh, this question of uh, the Anthropocene causing ecological migration and the state reacting to this phenomenon is something that uh, Thomas is going to discuss. So uh, I leave uh, the floor to uh, Ms. Thomas and Dr. Prashant Kumar. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes, you are. You are perfectly audible and visible. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Let me introduce myself to you before I start off my presentation. I am Tejas Gigi Thomas, this is scholar from VIT Bello, and this work is carried out with my co-author, Dr. Prashant Kumar from VIT Bello. It's indeed an honor and privilege to be part of this international virtual conference on recent advances in interdisciplinary humanities, and we feel really privileged and honored to be here with you. The topic for my paper presentation is Eyes Everywhere, ecological migration and state surveillance in the age of Iron Man. So the overall framework of the study is that in today's society, migrants or the citizens are closely monitored and exploited. And a comprehension of the complexities of surveillance and res resistance is crucial to guarantee a more democratic community in the near future. And disciplinary societies in the Foucauldian context have moved beyond the panoptical ecology. And today's monitoring is re in surveillance, enabled by digitalization, can adapt to any room today. But with the constant change in spaces, simply monitoring human actions would be inadequate. Surveillance is also increasingly being marked and products are being now sold on the basis of people's private lives. And this dual aspects of surveillance connect to safety and company is well suited to the new liberal agenda, but monitoring is always needed to be supervised to participate in the rightful sense. The states and the MNCs are, a, are in a challenging situation if and when the monitored resist surveillance and efforts are always being made by the state and its technology to properly monitor ecological migrations in the world nowadays. And this study claims that it is ecological and migration surveillance that makes Iron Man a strong adventure. And yet there are several cases in which his surveillance is inefficient through cinematic narrative. With the collective will of surveillance, unethical monitoring of ecologies and migration imposed on us, it can be resisted in a good extent in the near future as well. So surveillance is the process through which organisms and the surroundings are closely monitored with or without consent, with the assistance of humans or infrastructure in which we are living. That includes the gadgets and the other collective data on the beings and the interactions with each other and the environment. And this is typically with gather proof or threatened with blackmail and predict future unusual uh, activities that could try to avoid, which could ensure an administration in general. And modern architecture and technologies have developed, maintained the monitoring factor as an important element. And Iron Man being a cyborg is also apt to be part of the surveillance network, particularly being one of the historically invested self prof and state aid. So in this paper, the power of Iron Man derives enormously from the capacity to monitor individuals and ecology, also making a profit in the process. So Iron Boy, Iron Man embodies uh, bigger configurations, the control uh, societies, 
which governs more strategic surveillance than by a brute force that is uh, that is needed in the near future as well so the methodology of the study is using the evolution of pythomite for colding panoptical into a new surveillance and liquid surveillance where concepts like personal panoptical and band opticon are the like are discussed and the paper is undertakes the study of iron man his suit his relationship with the state and finally on how this has been bearing ecological migrants the closed room model panopticon method is used by the uh, Beetham's idea of panopticon borrowed by Foucault to talk about the nature of surveillance and the self governance of the supervised was an integral component of surveillance studies which was quoted by Elmer in 12, uh, 2012 and Dilak argued that the transitory nature of surveillance models were predicted by Foucault and the panopticon model operates as an efficacy way to understand the enclosure spaces that is always needed in the near future. And here space is closed and intended to help monitoring and guarantee the consequent of self-governance of space inhabiting topics. And surveillance is the best model, is local, expensive and often ineffective. Today's monitoring mechanisms are becoming more progressively fluid set by Bowman and Lawn in 2013, because they are not only monitoring individuals in closed spaces with fixed surveillance tools, but also in an in-mobile database is being gathered nowadays. And surveillance panoptical model maybe have a suitable treatment in Foucault, but in liquid surveillance, which in many ways is highly mobile and requires us to fit Foucault's attention and study that is needed in the new mechanisms, which is always involved. Going beyond the boundaries, which is called the liquid surveillance, is always used through draws, research, social media activities, cash cards, Google Maps, travel app applications, online money transfer, or other usages in a few mechanisms that allow for liquid monitoring. And it does not require that the topic be monitored statically. Monitoring becomes further complex by the increased willingness of the surprise to participate and many and more efficient panopticons are gadgets that one carries around today. Cyborg's arrival redefines our knowledge of monitoring, privacy and ontology as a whole. Not only the instruments or the monitoring topics such as mobile, even the information gathered as a consequence of monitoring is needed or it should be concentrated in the world today. And this dual aim of monitoring requires that the gathered information be transferred easily and immediately between different organizations and liquid surveillance will always there will be there to help us as a notion to better understand contemporary day to day monitored life. New surveillance is a place or no place to hide. So liquid monitoring is followed by a rise in the like, uh, likelihood of monitoring from a distance and is defined by a fresh uh, new way of understanding and it makes the warden's function almost obsolete in the classic panopticon. Instead of changing rooms to allow simple monitoring, surveillance today is changing gadgets and culture to allow for trouble-free, cost-effective monitoring strategy. And this is uh, procured by two main important obstacles, namely, number one, safety of those engaged in the monitoring in a particular topic or the area of research, or a high livelihood of being taught in the monitoring process. And these issues can be solved in the new monitoring way said by Gary Marx draws attention of how outdated or at least insufficient is the classical uh, definition of surveillance. And he points out in particular the problem of using close observation nowadays. And new monitoring is not necessarily promixable, nor it is just an observation. Marx's new surveillance description overlaps with the Leon's uh, concept of multi-level liquid surveillance. And resisting the surveillance is becoming more harder and the capacity to monitor from a distance without the required participation individuals is readily transferred from the information gathered through a particular scenario. So when art merges with daily life and politics, Iron Man has an adventure is the culmination of several monitoring events over the last few years. And not only the gadgets, but also the role of the state and the personal players. 
and the supervisory hierarchies and how one's personal place impacts supervision, surveillance standardization, and the debates surrounding surveillance safety, information collection, and the privacy that is being going on in the film. The Marvel Cinematic Universe MCU has come to occupy not only a big room in the globe of cinema with high investment and great yields, but also an enormous impact on the contemporary world as a consequence. It has been dubbed into several languages and as you know, it is quite famous. It is quietly held that art is merely a reflection of socio-political truth, particularly popular culture. And this always act as a scenario in which the finest illustration of how it is connected to everyday politics is uh, increasing nowadays. So the objective is using the thoughts of David Leon and Gary Marx as explained earlier. And this study would like to focus on Iron Man cinematic. Mr. Mr. Thomas, we are already late. So you'll have to just summarize and conclude now. I'm sorry about this. Okay. Yeah, so uh, after the surveillance that has been yielded through the uh, selected work of Iron Man, uh, here are a few of the techniques or the implemented that could be used, which is beneficial for our country in the uh, years to come. Namely, uh, number one, ensure the migrants' lives and safety are protected and that many migrants in danger are rescued and provided with the rightful uh, trend and ensure all the re uh, repatriations adhere to international law and properly protect migrants' human rights. And migrants should have access to education, and ensure that all broader management produce surf, uh, safeguard human rights. That includes the protect to information of migrants and migrants must be protected against torture and other types of violences and make sure that all migrants have the best physical and mental health possible and ensure migration governance is based on human rights and gender equality and recognize and increase the work of human rights activists to promote and safeguard migrants' human rights. So through this conclusion, I want to carry out is that modern day surveillance is from where it started and it has to improve and come a long way without even individualizations, realizing it, it can be spied out and becoming discipline themselves when they realize that this is the overall state of the community. The migrant who is perceived as a threat to the nationwide is now also a subject of various types of monitoring and we should act quickly to counter the toxic worldwide discourses which has been skewed and destructive view of reality is always there. And in addition to this study inspired the creation of a global techno technical network on migration and its relevance which is equipped to deal with migrant problems in rapidly changing and increasing diverse society need to be pondered about in the near future. Thank you. Right. Thank you. It, uh, that was a very interesting and provocative paper in, in the sense that uh, Thomas was, uh, is talking about situations which we are now facing very, very interestingly on a regular basis, especially we've seen you know, Syrian migrants trying to enter Europe. We're looking at Afghanistan, which is with where there will be probably an exodus, which uh, is sought to be, you know, al almost confined within uh, a kind of hell as it were. So not only are we looking at, you know, surveillance in the sense that how migrants will be looked at uh, when they enter, but also potential migrants uh, uh, being put under surveillance and locked into their respective areas. But I, I thank you, uh, Thomas. This is an interesting area in the sense that uh, the ways in which artificial intelligence is creating a network through which all of us, our Google searches, our uh, everyday activities, our Facebook posts become ways in which, you know, surveillance is as it were mapping an individual, his preferences, and his ideologies. So in that sense, uh, your paper sort of tries to address a very, very interesting idea. And just uh, one word of, uh, you know, uh, one word, I would say advice, but, you know, if you could come straight to your text, uh, then it would have probably added to our understanding of uh, what you were exactly trying to do with Iron Man. 
but I'd be very willing to uh, and keen to uh, sort of read what you've said uh, or what you've uh, articulated. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we can't take questions. And I, I can see that the organizers are, uh, <laughs> well, keen to go on to the next session. So thank you to everybody concerned, all paper presenters. And, uh, you know, my great applauds and, and congratulations to you for having taken up so many new areas. I'm sure these will be developed in your full papers and we'll have the privilege of reading them when they're published. Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to bring this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sain, for an excellent session. And with this, we move on to the session four of our conference. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Joseph Ching Velisco, a faculty member of the Department of Political Science and interim editor-in-chief of the Asia Pacific Social Science Review based in De La Sol University, Manila. He is currently pursuing further studies in international relations and public policy at the University of Macau. His research interest includes Chinese, Filipinos, Sino-Philippine relations, work ethics, and burnout. I now request Dr. Cheng to take over the session. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Sima. So welcome to session four of um, the second Rupkata International Conference on Recent Advances in Interdisciplinary Hum 